Hey, this is Charlie Peacock, and you're listening to the multiple award-winning podcast, The Business Side of Music, with your host and Rock Gods Hall of Fame member, Bob Bender. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, sitting across the table, I went back and looked at my notes. We started this podcast series seven and a half years ago. Ah, okay. You were literally the first guest on the show. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. That's been a while. Yeah, that's cool. 330 some odd episodes since then. Yeah. But Steve Creech started it all. Steve is a a world-renowned record producer, uh, engineer, Mixer, uh, has had studios in Indianapolis. Yeah, Indianapolis. In mm. here in Nashville and yeah. Kentucky. Have I missed any other place? Mm, no, a little room up in Chicago I used to help out There with. you go, yeah. and Chicago, uh, is joining us because one of the things that is an all-too-often question that is asked by people I want to get in the music business, and I, I think I want to start a studio. Now, you've, you've operated, owned and operated studios. Correct. And I have actually worked in a few studios in my life, mm-hmm. but the business is a lot different than it was when you and I started. Sure was. Back when electricity had just been invented. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, if you look at the... Evolution. You say you want an evolution. There you go. I mean, you could point to the technology. I mean, we were tape based back in the day. I was hybrid, so computers were weak and we couldn't do much in the box. So, but the interaction with usually people, real people in a room playing instruments and looking at each other and interacting, you know, yeah, the world was very different. Um, And you're right. We didn't really, well, we didn't have Pro Tools. Nope back in those days, nope. and you had to learn how to cut and splice two-inch tape yeah, and help. hope that you didn't get it wrong. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Wish I did a few times. Yeah, well, I think we all did. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, I was going through uh, my storage locker, and I found a couple reels of two-inch tape that really? I still wow. have. Are they marked what they are? They are marked what they are. Of course, it's nobody that anybody would know. And I have no idea what ever happened to those artists, uh, uh, but wow. I've got the tape. Yeah, I, you know, I've got some of two-inch tape. You know, before I had my studio fire back in the day, I had these big old bulkheads that ran ran along the length of the control room, and they had two-inch tape and one-inch tapes and cassettes and dats and F ones and A dat and all the different formats that we've evolved through. Yeah. To get to where we're at now. And and now the business, well, let's just cut to the chase. Yeah. Now you've got the 16-year-old kid who's got a notebook computer, like I have sitting here on the desk. Yeah. Uh, with Pro Tools or some kind of, you know, digital audio workstation. True. And they have an interface that they can plug their headphones in and, and plug a, a guitar or a keyboard or a bass into. And they'll record in the bedroom of their house or they'll record, uh, you know, in their bathroom or their garage if they're really uptown. Uh, Right. But but that's not really a true description of a studio. To me, it's it's kind of, you know, okay, that's fun. 
but uh, you're, you're not you're getting quantity, but you're not getting quality. Let's talk a little bit about the brief description of a studio, and honestly, what services go with it, if you don't mind. That's a good question. I. I, I only ask good questions. Well, I love. I'm, I'm a geek, right? Yeah. Uh, I, and since when I hit my 60s, that's when I realized and how I say, geekish yeah, I am. Yeah, because I say that lovingly. Yeah. Knowing you, we're, we, lo- we we're, love the geeks. Yeah, we're, we're know. both geeks. Uh, long before there was an internet, I would go to the library and I'd look up something like, "When was the first time someone had the concept of the atom?" You know, and I thought, "Well, it must have been around the 40s, then atomic power." No, it was 450 BC. When the concept of the atom. So, so I've always been insanely curious long before I was anything musical. So I look up the word, you know, studio, and all it really refers back to the core word, which is being studious or wanting to seek knowledge. So it kind of makes sense because if you're an artist or painter, let's say you're a fine painter, you can have a studio. All it is is just an environment where you can be creative. And so that's why I look at it. Now, and if you tack the word recording on it, I think the layman, I know you don't feel that way or you've been around, but the layman thinks of a room with a big console with lots of knobs and a window and some people on the other side and then pushing the button and say, okay, sing your big hit. You know, and that concept has kind of waned. There still exist. We're fortunate enough to be in Music City and we're in Nashville um, where a lot of those studios still exist but that's not necessarily less than extreme isn't it it's not the epitome uh well it can be for some people who have that vision uh, i think of it just as a creative space so i look at the functionality of it i guess you know what's the purpose what's the functionality how can you you're still a human being trying to manipulate technology in some form so as you know back in the day they would say drum machines are going to put drummers out of business and uh, AI is going to put songwriters out of business. We've talked about that before. I'm not afraid of the technology, but I, I see some people who are pretty reckless with it, you know, in my opinion, reckless. That's a good statement, and it's something I wouldn't have thought of, but well, yeah, you, you get a little fast and loose out there, don't you? I think you can, because if you're, if you're like me and you love the history of music— you know, you might hear a little motif or something, and you go, oh, that's Rachmaninoff. Oh, that's okay. It's right. We all build on that, or we're all influenced by that. From the, That's the way we learn to talk, is we mimic. And then the brain figures out an association and says, bottle, water, you know. Uh, but you want to evolve. So a lot of times, people don't get any farther than that. They just they think, oh, that's all the communication I need to do. I just need to mimic what I hear, and that's going to be successful. Or you mentioned services that, you know, you can do in a modern recording studio. It really hasn't changed much. You know, you can be a mixer. You can be a master guy. You can be, you can do custom composition, write jingles. You can do audio restoration. It's not always about doing the glamorous things of music. You know, it's anything to do with audio production or even podcast work like what you do. And I'm honored to be here, by the way, and uh, on this podcast, you got a, uh, quite a lineage now. And it only took us seven and a half years to get only, you back. Wow, that's that's good. Yeah, in dinosaur years, that's not long at all. No. Uh, so I hope I answered your question. That's kind of my definition of a studio and what it can do. The kid that is an audio geek like you and I has a basic understanding. Graduates from high school, maybe college. Mm-hmm. And they want to really get their their foot in the door in the business. Yeah. Does it make sense? Well, let me put it this way. Does it make more sense for that kid to go away to a recording school uh, like Full Sail? Or does it make more sense for that kid to spend some time interning in a bona fide, legitimate studio? Where Where do you think the practical experience comes from can you get it from the books or do you get it from sweeping up the floors and wrapping cables and making coffee or sweeping up the books i'm gonna try to answer that as succinctly and honestly as i can i i was a little intimidated when we brought up this subject because i'm kind of uh, an exception i feel blessed the way i did it and and i didn't think about it at the time when i was 
just a kid, I'd get calls to play in studios because I was a multi-instrumentalist even then. So I'd go play drums or something like that. And I was enamored with the environment. And I remember the first time I really walked into a studio control room and it's all damnly lit and a big old board and lots of lights and it's Hollywood, right, uh, with my friend Jay. And I, I didn't get the bug at that point, but I was impressed, you know, because I was impressionable. But it, um, it wasn't until I was playing in a band and we got offered a record deal, and then I thought it was okay to get engaged. And I'm just saying this is my life story, run it. And so I told, and we had a, we ran a residency on the East Coast. It was a good band, but there was some conflict, as you can imagine, and there can be conflict in the studio too on any professional level, but there was some friction within the band and I was uncomfortable going forward long term. The way it ended up for me was I was advised, you know what, you seem to work better in the studio because you understand people and etiquette, and you're musical enough, uh, you seem, you like electronics, which I was going to study electronics when I got out of college, stuff like that. So I kind of took it for granted, and it wasn't until many years ago that I thought, well, I need to open the studio. Now, the computers were still around, but there was no internet, and we had tape, like you said. It was an expensive adventure to get into the business, you know. I... You have consoles. I, you know, I still uh, have some of my old equipment, but the cost of entry was great, relatively speaking, and there was virtually no education readily available. It was University of Hard Knocks. Yeah, yeah, that's, sure, that's a good one. And so, being an intern or something like that made perfect sense because I. Countless stories I've read about engineers that I admired that worked on all these major songs that are historical figures now in the in the annals of recorded history. They a lot of times just say, you know, I just went there and I learned, you know. Jeff Emmerich recorded the Beatles, he was nineteen years old, he sent him a letter and said, Hey, can I work here? And they said, Okay. Well and they trained him. Nowadays it's all YouTube, right? And I'm on YouTube all the time. And I still search for that little nugget of something I don't know. And it's pretty rare, you know, so, yeah, well, we were doing that back in the 80s, you know, that kind of thing. So when somebody asked me, I have a grandson or I have a, a daughter that I want to get into the recording business, is that hard to do? I go, ooh, okay. That's a loaded question. Yeah, that's a loaded potato right there. I can give you a quick example. I want to be a light. I, I've been in education try to teach some of these people and all the all the time when you hear the question from an adult a parent an authority figure and you hear that question from a wannabe participant in the recording industry a guy or a girl that you know this should i go to school daddy should i go to school i can tell you that my nephew sean who i'm quite proud of he's you know he succeeded in their industries he's a good engineer he's out on the east coast and he's worked with bruno mars and some people like that so he's he's but when I first, I had a studio, and he was a little kid, and it's my sister's son, and he came to visit when he, I think he was 10 or 12, something like that. Um, and my sister says, oh, you're his hero. And I said, oh, no, this is hard work, you know, to run your own business. And so a few years later, after he got into a band and was drinking on carrying on and running up and down the coast, she called me. She said, we want to send him to full sale. Is that expensive? I go, yeah. Well, yeah, sort of. Is it worth it? Well, I knew some people down there, and I said, it depends. just like anything else, how are you going to apply yourself? I said, where's his discipline factor? How mature is he? You know, I just knew him as a kid. And I said, put him on the phone. And so Sean comes on the phone, and he says, hey, I want to be a recording guy like you, man. I want to start my own studio, and I want to do this. And I go, yeah, we all do that. Okay, now, let me ask you this, and I won't use the verbiage that I used with him because it's kind of off-color. But uh, I said, that's my sister's money. They're going to take out a second mortgage on the house. You'd better perform. you got to, you know, I'm tr talking to you as if you were my own son. And I'm saying, I expect good things of you. This, you know, you're going to have to be committed to strange hours. It's going to take a toll on your regular lifestyle. You know, I'd already paid my dues by that point. He says, I promise you, Uncle Steve, I promise you, I and I said, you'll be first in your class? And he says, I will work so hard. I said, you don't, if you don't know what they're talking about, call me. And if I don't know, I'll call somebody and I'll find out for you. 
Well, he goes off to school, and then he goes back to the East Coast in D.C., and a few years go by, and I'm producing a band that the, the daytime shift was the group called The Fray, and they were working on an album called How to Save a Life. And then we had the night shift when I was working with a three-piece power trio who I was producing, had an engineer, blah, 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 uh, in a studio near Bloomington, Indiana, uh, that was owned by some of the Mellencamp people. And uh, he sends a picture to my phone, and he's holding a double platinum record. And I, you know, I couldn't be more proud of him. Now, I knew what he had to go through to do that, and that kind of is a su successful thing, but I don't know how common that is. So th what I was going to do was try to give you an idea. I, I, initially, I sat down and did a whole bunch, I overthought this thing, and I put down all these facts and figures, and I, I found out some things, some current numbers that I hadn't thought of before, like um, the average recording engineer, and we're talking about nationwide makes about $37.55 a piece or an hour. I'm sorry. Which is not bad. No, it's, it doesn't seem bad at all compared to McDonald's. You know, it's twice as much money as McDonald's. Uh, but just like we're talking about student loans and overhead and things like that. And that's not too bad. Then you go on to, say, finance.com or you go to salary.com and they say, uh, how much should I be making if I... Well, the median income... Uh, and, of course, keep in mind, we have all these people with tons of money and people with no money. So the average is $78,000 a year. And the, and if you look it up, what does an average recording engineer make? $78,000 a year. And so that I thought, well, what does that equate to? Because I never really worked like that. You know, if you got a 40-hour work week, you're working in an office, and you know this you know, 52 weeks in a year, you're going to do 2,000 hours in that chair. Not counting drive time, things like that, how you want to spend your life. If you divide that figure by that and deduct tax here in, in Tennessee, they don't have income tax, but everywhere else it seems like they do. So if we're talking to people in Montana or, you know, in California or, you know what I mean, in uh, Delaware or something, you know, where they do pay taxes, then that 78000 comes out to about 64000 So I'm not going to name any names, but. There's a guy I know who um, was a prominent music attorney, and he was here in Nashville, and he made a lot of money for people, and then he retired, and he kind of lost his perspective, I think, in some ways. I still count him as a friend, and I've known his son since he was born. He called me up, and he said, and I hope this is in light of what you asked me, he calls me up, and he says, listen, the kid's name is Dave. He says, uh, Dave wants to, to be in the music business. I go, ding. And I thought of my nephew, right? That's why I told that story. And I said, yeah. And I didn't want to go into all this with him, but he is a, he's an attorney, and they charge by the hour, right? So he wants to know how many billing hours is this? That kept coming back again and again and again. He's kind of cold-hearted about it. He says, I'm not going to invest in my son's future unless I'm sure that he's going to succeed. You know, what are your contacts in the industry in Nashville? I said, I don't do that. I don't go out and at my should, but I don't socialize and I don't talk about what I do much. Uh, yeah. Well, let's face it. Yeah. You and I have both done that. We've spent those years rubbing elbows and handing out business cards uh, yeah. and shaking hands, kissing yeah. babies. We've done all that networking, and that's still a very viable part of this business. It still is. Yeah. yeah. But it's something you and I don't necessarily do anymore because we've paid our dues. I get invited to a lot of events. I don't mean to get off track here. No, go but ahead. But I get invited to a lot of events, and I know you do too. You were at a thing a couple months ago where you met some guys and we wound up having them on the show. Oh, yeah. You know? Mastering.com. Mastering.com. Yes. Michael. And um, I get invited to things like that all the time. Mm. Our good friend Vinny Rivas, you know, right. likes me to attend some of his gatherings. You know what? I'm just as comfortable sitting at home you know, in my sweatpants and T-shirt, I'm watching TV with my wife. Uh -huh. But the young kid, when we talk about investing, it's not just money, like your attorney friend. No. It's investing time and, and building resources and relationships. Well, you know, I'm glad you said that because to a couple of old dogs like us, you know, I know I've known you for a while and know some of your history. You've done some really cool things. 
And that gives you credibility, I guess, when, you know, people ask. And I hope to think that I have a body of work that will survive me. But um, yet I stayed insanely curious about the industry, you know, who, who's buying what and why, and, and done that underground stuff too, you know, and try to keep up with the technology, which, you know, if somebody asked me, oh, what's a hysteresis loop or what's a nominal impedance load of a 600 ohms or whatever, or how does this plug in do this? And what is gain staging? I said, yeah, okay, that's all technical stuff. And that's book knowledge. Yeah, it's book knowledge. It's all that. But what I'm thinking is, is, is a bigger concept for the people listening is I would want to explore, okay, in CIA training, okay, I had a, a well, I had, he's still alive, of course. I have a brother who was in the Secret Service, and he is very secretive about it. By To this day, he still won't tell me what he did and why. And I understand that there's need for that, kind of a need to know. But I did a little research, and one of the things that if you're going to be an agent, a CIA agent in particular, they teach you the, the concept, the difference between perception versus perspective perception versus perspective and then and that's kind of a cool bit in a way because once i started digging into the psychology of everybody's so different right we don't know uh who do you want to work with and who do you don't want to work with and, and why can somebody like bob bender go to an event and be personable and shake hands and they succeed or somebody like me even so to me the, the difference between perception is perception is an individualistic thing I, I'm in this room and I perceive that light over there and I'm using my senses or I'm using my experiences in life to say, I perceive this. So when I hear this song, for instance, you know, for the first time, and I'm talking about, I'm putting on my producer hat for just a moment. I'm, I don't want to think about, oh, the hi-hat's too loud or uh, he's rushing that drum fill or that rhyme is corny, you know, that's, that's not really what I want to do. I want to do something where I just kind of feel something. And then on the second listen, you can't unhear it, right? But that's a perception thing. That's an individualistic thing. That's like saying, I like shrimp, but I hate steak. But I like this, but I hate that. It's an acquired taste, right? And so I would tell a recording engineer who wants to be in the business, lady or male, I'm very, very blessed to be a mastering engineer for as long as I have been. You don't have a dog in the fight. The song's mixed. You have no perception of it. You don't care. Well, I care, but so it's all referential, and that's a matter of perspective. So I would take that recording that I was submitted to me, and I would think hmm, it's very similar to David Bowie's "Golden Years" or John Mayer's "Dancing in a Burning Room," or you get the idea. You can find a reference in my mind somewhere. Where well, there's a lot of them in there, uh, and I might pull up that recording and go, "What makes that work?" Oh, yeah. It's successful. So you could apply those things. But the perception and the perspective are different. And then I got to thinking about profit versus value. And how did that compensate into rewards? You know, you and I have paid our dues. And what does that mean to, to you? It would be interesting to talk to you about it off mic sometime. You have things to be, you're blessed by them. You have a wonderful wife, you have a successful show, you got a cool dog. <laughs> you know, uh, I have some things to be happy about. And so if you choose this profession and you're looking at the word profit and you're looking for clickbait, you know, the it becomes harsh because in the business, strictly business world, they're looking for a 30% slice of profit margin for growth, you know. I don't know why it's that way, whether you're buying mattresses, just a 30% markup, or or houses, or whatever like that. But generally speaking, let's say 30%. So you take that, and you want to grow every year. And how do you multiply that times 1.3 and get that 30% year after year after year? It's not feasible most of the time. You and I are in Music City, so lots and lots of competition. You know, this podcast has flourished because it's been informational. It's uh, really helped a lot of people gain perspective, and it's it's informative, you know. And I, I'd like to be like that, you know, in my later years. My hearing, thank God, is still really good. 
I still do mastering. I still do production work. I still write tunes. Every once in a while, you catch a phrase, and you go, wow, it's a long way down when you're high off the ground. Go, okay, that rhymes, you know. Or you meet somebody, like I did at Vinny's function the other day, and the curious Steve comes out and asks the questions about, how did you arrive at that perception? Get it? Perception versus perspective. I like referential things because they give you perspective. History gives you perspective. All the things you did in your touring years, you know, um, I don't know if you talk about it much on the show, but uh, the fact that you work with Ringo's All-Star Band, that's a big deal to me. You know, I think, wow, that's so cool. You know, I'm a big Beatles fan. So when I look at the Beatles catalog, for instance, you know, why is it still valid? You know, I could say, oh, did you know 29% of their catalog, they had a key change? Most people think key change. You know, look at the world charts now, like in chart metric and things like that, and you listen to the Beyonce's, Tex Mahalem, or Samantha Carpenter, or anybody that you you know point the finger to. Is this the future of the industry? Is this are these are the people you want to record? Because most, of the, I got to be honest, most of the people I talk to about being in the recording industry, they think music. You know, they want to record some big star, right? Who doesn't? Uh, well, maybe they're, I don't question their motives. I don't know. Maybe they just want the glory. Maybe they want the money. They I'm, want the street cred? Yeah. Yeah, street cred. But we could do an entire series of shows on what is uh, paying your dues? You know, what does that mean? Do you have to suffer for your art? You know? I I look at this example of this lawyer, and when I give him the numbers, and, and he says, well, I'm not going to subsidize my kid. I learned the hard way. And I said, hey, how did you get to be a music attorney? Well, my parents, you know, they did this, this, and this, and they paid for my education. And I said, oh, then you had a mentor. You had support. You had somebody who believed in you. Well, I had to. He was my son. You didn't have to. If you love your son... You want him to be successful. Use your resources to help him get resources. And it wasn't until I got to be about 30 that I realized that so many people, when they're young, and we probably did it too, I don't know about you and Deb, but you go into debt with these credit cards and things, and your intentions are good because you want your standard of living to be like your parents. And it took them 20, 30, 40 years to get there. So you want to skip to the head of the line. And I don't think in today's recording industry you get away with that unless you're Billie Eilish and your brother is a logic pro whiz and some of those opportunities do exist to record the next up and coming band but I, you know like I said there's a lot of other things audio restoration is something that I, I got uh, I did some things for the Library of Congress and I thought oh that doesn't sound too glamorous but they would this is way back when but they sent me some um, 78s you know, and I could play them, and they were cracked, and they had historical value, and and I was able to use the crude software that they had then to remove some ticks and pops and cracks and restore it. And it makes you feel great to think, okay, I, I did something good that wasn't necessarily glamorous, but I used the technology wisely. So I kind of went off on a tangent on you, but um, I would try to instill that if I was still teaching and somebody would ask me you know how much money can I expect to make and I would just in a loving way I would rather I mean so oh, now I got to spend time and find out what their real values are you know where's the plot power and the perception versus the perspective and you know I'm, I'm trying to live by that I, th I think it makes sense in the music industry we're going to take a break, get in a word for a couple of our sponsors who support the show. And then when we come back, we're going to have some more compelling conversation with Steve Creech. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Mark Allen Barnett, singer, songwriter, creative coach, and mentor. Are you an artist or songwriter or a family member or friend of someone who is? Are you trying to find your way through the often confusing world of today's music business? I'm here to help. Over the past 40 years, I've written and recorded hit songs, have had more than my share of live performances, and have seen the ups and downs of the music industry and what Music City, also known as Nashville, has to offer. 
I'm here to share that information with you. The Mark Allen Barnett Songwriting Tours of Nashville are a one-day to multi-day private interactive workshops developed to help you discover your best approach to songwriting, performing in front of a live audience, along with the correct way to network within the music industry. Our workshops are based around what you need to know. While in Nashville, you get an insight from behind the scenes, learn about the history of Music City, separate fact from fiction, and give yourself or a loved one the time of your life. This workshop makes the perfect gift for someone you love who wants to get their foot in the door of the music business the right way. For more information, go to www.markallenbarnett.com or www.musicchoosesyou.com. Remember, you don't choose music. Music chooses you. Are you a fan of 80s and 90s country? Then check out Throwback Country Music, a weekly nationwide show hosted by me, Rick Jones. I have exclusive interviews with legends and icons that include Grammy Award winners and Grand Ole Opry stars. You can listen to the show wherever you get your podcast or watch it on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. For more info and access to these options, visit our website at throwbackcountrymusic.com. That's throwbackcountrymusic.com. You're listening to the business side of music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, on the business side of music, Steve Creech is sitting across the podcast table. We're having a conversation regarding recording studios and the recording process. Is it a profitable venture to get into anymore? You and I have witnessed really somewhat the demise of Music Row yeah. here in Nashville, which used to be record label, management office, publishing company, studio. Yeah. Then wash, rinse, and repeat. You know, it was just how Music Row was laid out. And uh, I just saw a few weeks ago where Omni Studios, one of the, the great ones here in Nashville, just got bulldozed down so they can build more condos or a hotel or apartments. I didn't see that. And we've lost so many great studios that way. Uh, At the same time, Hendersonville, Franklin, Berry Hill, which are all suburbs of Nashville, they've still got a plethora of good recording studios. Yeah. Does it make sense these days, and we've talked about what the worth is of the engineer, Mm -hmm. does it make sense to invest in an actual physical studio knowing you have to buy a decent console. You have to buy the plugins, the software. Mm-hmm. You have to buy that outboard gear. The microphones alone could be a small fortune. And you have to have an acoustically treated room. Or are you better off being that 16 year old kid with a notebook computer and an interface and some type of software? Ooh. Well, and I know it's apples and oranges. It's big difference. Yeah. I mean, you work for Curb, for Mike Curb. I was getting in the business about the same time. Yeah, there was a structure then, right? Recording studios could do the initial investments. People saw that as a profitable thing. So non-musical people would invest. You know, you could go to the bank or whatever. And they'll say, yeah, what do you need? Well, I need a million. I need three million. I'm going to build this studio and I need a console. If, if you look at the history of Nashville, I don't know if you want to talk specifically about Nashville, there were the visionaries like Jimmy Bowen and people like that that modernized the recording industry in Nashville. Or if going back even further, there's the Bradley Brothers and the Quonset Hut and you know people like Patsy Cline and Hank and all those, the legendary first-generational country people or even the first-generational rock and rollers like Jerry Lee and Little Richard and Elvis, you know. The technology was minimal. Uh, the emphasis was on performance, and the recording studio's function was to capture a performance, words and all. So it'd be like, click, there's your picture. Oh, don't like that picture, take another one. Don't like that picture, take another one. Put the light on it, click, take another one. It wasn't very hard to do that because you had one mic or just a few mics, and you didn't have to have an overhead or really much technology. You just had a room. And the story 
is evident in all the legendary recording studios I've ever read about, with the exception of Abbey Road, which was a purpose-built studio in 1931. And, and I got the pleasure of going through Abbey Road, and they gave me the, the tour, and I got the T-shirt, and it was wonderful. I, I'm, like I said, I'm a big Beatles fan. But the studios that we take for granted, like you said, that are going, uh, getting bulldozed down, which is heartbreaking to me. You know, I've been in Omni. I worked in Omni. I've been to Studio 19. I, you know, Blackbird is still around in Berry Hill. And, and like you told your listeners, that's a suburb. Uh, but as far as music row, it was just a residential area. And they thought, nobody will ever come this far out of downtown. Look how far it is from downtown. It's like a mile or so. Wow, you know, we have some peace and quiet out here in the burbs. No. The guy next door, and the guy next door, and the guy next door, and the next thing you know, you got Music Row, which for the listeners who might not know this, is basically just a few blocks north and south, and a few blocks east and west. And yeah, it's heartbreaking for me to see that, because they were seeing the demise of what they considered to be the profitability of the land. You know, let's build a condo. Let's Let's burn the place down so that we can start over again. And I, I do have a little bit of a heartbreak in, in seeing that because now, okay, this is what I would say, say to somebody who's just getting into thinking about profit is what you don't spend. Don't spend it because it's still in your pocket. So your resources, you, I, I'll, I'll be honest here, I, I, I learned the hard way, but I had like a big brother in the industry, and his name's Al Stone. He's passed on. He was a, a legendary FM DJ. And Al uh, and I went to Cleveland one time because he was speaking there. And I would say, Al, oh, i got to have this microphone. If I had this microphone, I could rule the world. And he says, what is it? And I says, it's called a U-47. He goes, yeah, I don't know about that. No, I'm in blah, 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 German. And he says, but it's, you know, even then it was like $3,000. And he says, yeah, how long is it going to take you to earn back that $3,000? Yeah. Well, I'll just get it on a credit card. And so he wrote a book about recordings. Now, this is what that today's technology is obsolete. But he wrote a book. And in the foreword, he says, I wrote this book for my little brother, Steve. And I, and I, now that he's passed on, I found a copy of it the other day, in a, and I inherited some of his equipment. Yeah, I get all teary-eyed, and I go through it, and I go, oh, yeah, he, I remember when he told me that. I remember, the, we, we don't have the mentorship, because a lot of it was the intern, you know, or, or looking over the shoulder of somebody and not having to own the equipment, right? They, don't, they didn't buy that console. It's not their console. They work there. Just like if you went to a grocery store, you don't own those groceries until you pay for them. So hopefully I'm answering the question in a concise and orderly manner. But if you have, if you go into it thinking, I need a room, look at this picture of Motown or Sun or all these old places. They're, they're not very fancy. They're just storefronts and rooms. You compare that to Studio One uh, at Abbey Road, and you go, okay, that was a different model. Those are the extremes. But if you don't spend the money, you have more of a chance of being profitable. And there's one other thing I wanted to add to that answer, I hope. When I started out, I was single, and I was just a kid. I was in my 20s. No disrespect to anybody in their 20s. But uh, so I didn't have any kids. I didn't have a mortgage. I, I bought a cheap car. It was a piece of crap, but it got me around, you know. And so I'm not putting down somebody with a laptop and a little scarlet interface because the technology is, you know, you get a lot more bang for your buck with the equipment these days. You know, you can, I'm not going to name brands. I don't want to do that. But people ask me, oh, you can do this, you can buy this, but you know, it sounds great, you know. But it's like any other tools. What are you going to do with it? You know, and and do you think I I didn't want to go that way, but if I said to somebody, oh, here's a drum set. Now, Ringo Starr and all those Beatle records, they didn't record his drums in stereo until the last album. He never had two tracks on a tape machine, and the headphone mixes. They never had a stereo headphone mix. Everything was always in mono through these called them sage brown, these nasty headphones. It sounded like crap, you know, but 
they still did some pretty good stuff. And that was the norm, you know? You get a, um, um, but well, I started seeing the differences when people start saying, well, no, I need, I need this in my headphones, I need this, and we'll add it later, and we'll fix it in the mix. And I had a guy in not too long ago, and he says, well, can't you just copy and paste it? Yeah, I could, but my mind picks up on that, you know, and the average listener will pick up on that. And as a mastering guy, and I hope I'm not digressing too much, but as a mastering guy, I lived through the loudness wars. I saw things that had dynamics, then I saw them slowly get crushed and crushed and crushed and smashed, and then now we're out of that, and that's where streaming comes in. So you can't ignore streaming, right? It's here to stay. Physical medium is not what it used to be, even though I'm kind of glorified to see, what do you call it, uh, some vinyl resurgence. Right. You know, we talked about that, even cassettes. In other countries besides the U.S., if you're listening, they still have respect for other mediums. They go, they're looking for the music. They don't care where it comes in. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've done this here recently, Bob, but I took, I've been kind of nostalgic, and I went back and made a short playlist on Spotify of songs that I used to crank up in the car, you know. And I made a playlist, and I have a real nice studio now, and... It's all pimped out. And so I can make comparisons. And I would play, oh, there's that Todd Rundgren song. Oh, it's, it's kind of boxy sounding, isn't it? Oh, wow, it's not what I thought. Well, let me hear this song, you know. Oh, there's a song from a group called Diesel in Germany. I used to think that was hi-fi. And then you hear a, a Steely Dan track and you go, oh, there's more bass in that than I thought. So I learned that by working as a mastering guy doing compilations where I'd have 10, 12, 14 tracks and I'd have to make them play nice. So what I found out later that this is what really helped develop my ear was to listen to the, how this song compares to this song, this compares to this song. If you look at, do you do a lot of research on the world charts? Who's, who's buying what? Who's listening? Yes, I do. Yeah. And I especially like to look at what works in other countries around the world because we can get blinders on our eyes yeah. and look at just the focus of the United States or North America. Uh -huh. But there's so many amazing artists in in South America or in Asia or in, uh, uh, in Africa mm -hmm. that we don't even know about here in the States because... They're not top 20, they're not top 30, but they're cranking out amazing material. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, artist that I talked to you about last time I saw you, her name is Cindy Alter. She was in a group called Clout, and they had number one song in seven countries, including the UK and South Africa and all that sort of thing. I talked to her this morning, and I said, I'm really nervous. She says, why? She says, I'm going to be on a show with Bob Bender today, and we're going to talk about profitability of studios. And then I thought about who I was talking to. She's seen a lot. She's traveled all over the world. They opened up for the Bee Gees, the police, some of the people that you've been around, you know, big names who actually sold records. <laughs> you know, she's very nonchalant about it. And when I met Hal Blaine in Cleveland, you know, I was sitting on a couch with him. This is way back when. And he says, oh, look, there's Les Paul. And I go, oh, it's Les Paul. And he says, yeah, come on over. I'm going to introduce you. And I go, I can't. I can't talk to this Les Paul. You know? And he says, sure. And I, then I realized that Hal is a real guy. And, you know, he worked with Sinatra. And he played on Beach Boys and Monkeys records and all kinds of TV themes and stuff like that. He's the most recorded drummer in history. He was part of the Wrecking Crew. Wrecking Crew, correct. Yeah. yeah. And Hal kind of thought he was amused by me, you know, that I knew the minutia and I had the records. And he says, how old are you? You know, I think he was kind of surprised. I meet young people who know some of the history and they, and I'm, I'm curious about something. I've been hearing, maybe you know this, that uh, new music sales are down in a lot of ways, that a lot of the younger people of the demographic, 35 and under, are gravitating back toward music pre-1997. I don't know if that's true or not, but let's say for a second it is. And what happened in 97? Well, that's the telecom thing. That's when most recording studios were allowed, like the trust busters, and they were consolidating. And then, you know, a lot of uh, people, I guess it'd be iHeart, Clearcom, all that stuff, you know, 
the beginning of the demise of the record company structure, kind of like the Hollywood um, system, you know, like MGM and all that, you know, where they would groom their actors and teach them to dance and teach them to, you know, play to the camera. A lot of those acts were nurtured. A lot of the people that you have worked with uh, had that kind of structure, right? And I'm kind of curious because 97, well, Pro Tools kind of an auto tune came around that time. So I hear it, you know, I listen to a Morgan Wallen song and I'll go, oh, they're using that as a gimmick or they're, there's this, this and this. And I try not to let it distract me, you know, just for the love of the music. But back to the other example, when I compared all these songs that I loved, how they made me feel, I can relate back to these people who are just getting started. And they might not be thinking like that, like I do. They might not be thinking, oh, that's got a lot more bottom on it, or that one sounds crushed, or that's grainy, or that stereo image is not what it used to be. So I like to think that, uh, you know, people like you and I still have a lot to offer. Anyone who's receptive to that. I, I love talking minutia, these infrasonics and subsonics. and You can't hear this, but it's there, you know? And uh, just like the atom thing, you know, you can't see the atoms, but they're there. They, they make up those vibrations, make up existence as we know it. So those molecules moving through the air. We're going to get another word in for a couple more of our sponsors. And we come back, we're going to have a few more questions and comments with Steve Creech. You're listening to the business side of music. Branding. What is it really? It goes by many names, marketing, licensing, and image, when in reality, it's seven key branding formulas that all need to harmonize perfectly. Mess up just one formula and you have compromised the whole brand build. Dead Horse Branding facilitates all seven formulas under one roof, building, promoting, and marketing all brands at all different stages of their level. We are a marketing team's dream, and we were built to service talent, artist managers, record labels, independent artists, iconic brands, legacy estates, and startups. Rooted in music and seated across other industries like fashion, various talent, hospitality, authors, interior designers, lifestyle brands, and corporate entities. The seven branding formulas do not discriminate. Seven branding formulas, all in one swift movement. Sick of beating that dead horse? Come to Dead Horse. Please visit us at deadhorsebranding.com or send us an email to info at deadhorsebranding.com. As a musician, you have a dream. That vision of what success looks like for you. Though it's not only about the money, money is a part of it. Whether you've been extremely successful or just striving to maintain a regular cash flow, you need a plan. Money Concepts can help you develop a customized plan to achieve the financial stability and success you want. For over 40 years, Money Concepts has been providing holistic financial planning services to individuals, families, and business owners. As an independent firm, Money Concepts and their associates are committed to always represent the best interest of the client. It's really about independence coupled with committed benevolent interest which means that they can represent your client, not a product supplier. It's not about selling products. It's about helping you achieve success. To learn how this can benefit you, contact John Adams at 737-867-9309. That's 737-867-9309 for more information. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, Business Side of Music, sitting across the podcast table. In case you forgot, Steve Creech, world-renowned producer, mastering engineer, uh, who's been sharing his insight, the future of the recording studio. Now, during the break, we talked about my world, mm. which revolved around live touring, yeah. the live concert performance, and selling records, because, you know, without the ability to sell records or get music on the radio, you didn't need the studio because they, they go hand in hand. They really do. Yeah. The future of the studio, do you see it still being a, a viable opportunity for someone who works within the music business to, can we get creative beyond the notebook and the interface 
and and you mentioned earlier before the break the the tables are turning a little bit we're starting to listen to music 1997 and before that's pretty much all i listen to now i will listen to like the latest metallica or pat metheny mm-hmm. or the foo fighters cuz i have my favorites mm-hmm. and i want to hear what they're doing but i always seem to make that turn back to older music because for me a perfect example one of my favorite all-time songs was two of them okay actually what's that um santana's black magic woman gypsy queen okay okay yeah. it's classic almost every time i hear it i hear something new and i've been listening to that for 50 some odd years mm-hmm. the other one is tower of powers what is hip oh yeah and I always, always hear maybe something that Dave Garibaldi, some kind of a, a riff he did on the drums, or uh, Rocco Prestia on bass. Oh, my gosh, I didn't know he went up, you know, seven positions on the neck to play, you know, that higher end part and then comes back down. Or, or the, you know, what Doc Kupka would did, you know, with the Barry sax. There's so, there's so much depth that, don't think we have anymore at least i'm not hearing it those little subtle nuances that when we listen to music back then that i just don't pick up those flavors today well (laughs) well bob i can i can (laughs) like i said i'm a geek right so i get the aes papers the audio engineering society papers and a lot of it is scientific nonsense and some of it is captivating to me, okay? And they these demographics, like we're talking about chart metric and places like that, there's a reason why people gravitate to those recordings. And my, this, this is not just my opinion, but this is theories and people. I, I pulled out a lot of my old interviews that I, not mine personally, but interviews with uh, in magazines or whatever of people like Nostradamus who are predicting what the future of the recording industry, you know, and a lot of, sadly, a lot of those guys are gone, like Al Schmidt, you know, he was an engineer's engineer, Bruce Wedeen did the Michael Jackson stuff, Uh, Tom Dowd did, you know, Clapton and all these things. Those people, Tom Dowd could mix a song by just looking at the meters. You know, he just was, he had to understand a dynamics and, and spectral things and definition and prioritizing what should be heard. Because I have some philosophies that I could share. For instance, I could say, if everything's loud, nothing's loud. If everything's pristine, it's boring. If it doesn't have any nuance to it, you don't have anything to look forward to on multiple listenings. I get, to this day, I get people say, oh, please, will you listen to my CD? And I kind of dread it in a way. Because oh, I hope I like it. I'm going to try to like the music first. But a lot of times, if I if I don't like it, it's because I'm distracted by something I hear. Now you were talking about the virtues, and I love that too. Like the other day, I heard a paperback writer, and I heard this little fret noise I never noticed before because it's been you know demixed, remixed. There's an edit, and she loves you about two thirds of the way through. I'm not going to tell you where it is because it, it destroys your perspective, and you go, "Oh!" and you can't unhear that. Or like a blooper in a Star Wars movie where the guy hits his head on the beam. You know, if you know what's there, you can laugh with it. There's a lot of anecdotes we could talk about in that world, but um, you know, if I like to think that good recordings, you, you well, starts with mixing or good arrangements, right? And a lot of that, I'll tell you what, maybe it has to do with people who are courteous musically. And they, let's say you're playing your bass and I'm playing the drums or whatever. I'm listening to you and I'm getting out of your way, or I should. I'm reacting to you in real time. It goes back to the virtues of having real musicians or a community or people in the same room with the same goals, a team effort, the humanity of it. You know, when when I talk to people like you and they're passionate, they go, oh, wow, have you heard this, you know, I, I don't know, make up something, you know, have you heard Kid Charlemagne? 
you know, and then did you hear that guitar solo? Wow, you know, why is that? The guitar solo stands on its own. And when we were growing up, you wait for that guitar solo because the guitar solo was the best part of the damn song. You know, excuse my language, but and you could sing it. You could sing it down, 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 and it's a musical entity. When things went loop based, and they still generally are, the loops have already got a lot of processing in them. They're baked in. They EQ, the effects, everything quantized, blah, blah, blah. And so you're making a cake with corn syrup and, and some elements that you know you shouldn't be eating. And if you looked at the menu or the recipe, but, you know, everybody else does it, so why not? I'm not saying anything bad about people who have that kind of music. Where, But, you know, if, if, when I, I talked to Will Lee, and I don't know if you know who that is, he's a bass player, uh, and he was in David Letterman's band with Anton Figg and Sid McGinnis, and they were the house band on the Letterman show for 30 years, basically. And uh, Paul Schaefer was the musical director. And I never met Paul, but I have met Will. And I'd say... So when you were working on the Steely Dan things, you know, the Nightfly and stuff like that back in the early 80s, do you have click tracks? Were you playing to a click? Oh, no. Are you kidding? We didn't play click tracks. He said the Beatles never played to a click track. It was all about Ringo. If they speed up, slow down. He says, I could tell you in this song where this speeds up and this slows down. Now, that doesn't hurt my opinion of it because that's human. And when I was a, a, a studio drummer or touring around playing... Yeah, I know I'm going to rush a little bit because it's exciting, and then I'll come back and restrain myself. And I love the interaction. And those records that you're talking about have these flaws, these little weird things, you know. Uh, I love that stuff, man. I I would go back to Abraxas, you know, and listen to it and go, yeah, some of the guitar tones are piercing. But then I'm also a recording guy, and I know how it was done, and it's like a magic trick. And if you know how the magic trick's done, it's not as cool. You know what I mean? Because it's all good mag magicians are like um, their their stock and trade is misdirection. You know, you're looking at this, and they're doing this trick, and if you, well, how did they do that? And I had a guy, uh, his name's Kevin, and he was coming over to work on the studio, and he says. He's, he's a sweet guy. He's a good old boy. He's, you know, he's a smart man. He's educated. He come in, he goes, why do you have that stuff on the wall? And why do you have this big old screen? And what do you do here? And I said, come here, Kevin. And I sat him down in the space bar, played him one of my tunes. And it was, it was very cool in a way because it wasn't cut to a click or anything like that. It's a demo. And he says, he turned to me with disbelief. He said, how'd you do that? And I said, how did I do what? And he says, how'd you do all that stuff? And I said, well, I just hear it in my head, and I did it. You know, don't hesitate, just go. Kind of like we're talking about if you're going to be a recording person, got to start somewhere. It might not be for you, but start someplace. Got to get going. And so, but here's what the thing, the reason I'm telling you this. Kevin, uh, the song was called IOU. And it's the first time he heard it. And he's not a musical person. But... He turned around and he goes, do you know that part? And I go, no, what are you talking about? And he said, that part where you had the, I owe you, I owe you, you, and, you know, and, you know, and I go, yeah. I said, you remember that? From one listen, you heard something? He goes, yeah, that's pretty cool. And so I saw him about a week or so later by something else, and he looked over at me and he sang back that little phrase. He's not a singer, but he sang back that little phrase, and I thought, oh, I made an impression on him. Okay, well, those songs made an impression on you. Pretty cool. So you, you asked about the technology as how creative you can be with it. If you're going to be in the producer's chair, you're asked your opinion. You're expected to give your opinion. You're a, a sage or a collaborator. But if you're not, and they just get, mix this, you know, or master this, that's okay, too. You know, you don't you have to offer up your opinions all the time. In Nashville, where we are, there are many recording schools. You can get credits, things like that, that I never dreamed of. I mean, it didn't exist when I did it. I got into it. And I had a young lady come over to the studio, the first studio that you visited me at. And she was about to graduate. And she says, well, 
I don't know about mastering. It sounds kind of boring. I mean, and I said, I understand, because I would go out on stage and play, you know, hundreds of people, and then I'd be locked in a room by myself for 16 hours working on a song. So, extremes. And I said, so really, how, what did you learn in school about this? Oh, I had a choice. I could either take this or mastering, and I thought, mastering is boring. I said, what is mastering? And she says, you just make it loud. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> the kids at school, you just make it loud and make sure it's not too boomy or something. I don't know. And I said, well, you know, you want to be an intern. That's kind of what I do. I was sort of embarrassed. And I said, um, I'm not going to tell you your name, but I said, so what do you want to do? Come on, kid. What do you want to do? Well, I want to be in the studio, and I'm with a band, and I want to tell them when I think they're screwing up. You know, oh, I think you should go faster there. I don't like this part. I want to, so you want, to be, you want to control the situation. You want to be the producer? You want to be like you're directing the boy band and you're telling them what to play and, and what songs to record and, you know, control freak? I'm thinking, ooh, that's in her personality profile. Oh, you know, I'm glad she didn't choose mastering because she would not be a good candidate for me. I have a more grassroots approach. So back to that perception versus perspective thing. That didn't work for her, and it wouldn't have worked for me. So if you're looking to get into the business and you think, I can record anything and everything, you know, when I, when I first went into the mastering chair working for another company, I didn't have anybody. You know, they said, you're the ears of the company. And I didn't have anybody to really compare to or confide in. So, you know, it was one of those deals where, I didn't have a lot of perspective, but once I did it for a long time, I realized that a lot of it's referential. Kind of you have to get your hands dirty and let people talk and be themselves. And I'm hoping that if you get into the recording industry and you start your own studio, that you realize how important it is to not make the mistake I did. Get out there and meet people like yourself. Be accepting of other personalities and other perspectives and other approaches. And don't think you're going to get it all on YouTube because that's two-dimensional. You need people. People need people. And you're going to need help. And, you're, and if you can find a mentor, God bless you. Here's a shout-out to our loyal listeners. Without all of you, we would not be one of the most listened-to music industry interview podcasts. I wrote this thing. You think I know how to read it. <laughs> Including achieving number one status in many countries around the world according to Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy our show, please check out our Facebook page at the Business Side of Music Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and definitely hit the like button. While you're at it, go to our page on YouTube and click on the Business Side of Music Podcast to subscribe. You can check out our video webcasts there and get to see me and our guests, such as Steve Creature in the studio. Uh, along with Buddy the Music Doc, who made his entrance earlier, but has since left the uh, the building. Also, special thanks to Sennheiser Microphones for supplying us with top-notch gear for our use here in the studio, including the MK4 microphones and the HD300 Pro headphones. It's always appreciated to receive support from such a great company such as Sennheiser. Last but not least... Check out and follow us on X at Biz Music Podcast. That's B-I-Z Music Podcast. Steve Creech, wealth of information. We're not going to wait another seven years to get you back in the studio. And we got, we got a lot more to talk about in the future. Oh, yeah. I got, I got to pick your brain a little bit. I want to learn some things from Bob Bender. So. Uh, we'll do it again. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.